Greetings! Sir Reginald Cornelius Cadwaller Nitpick the Fourth here. I invite you to join me as we investigate the socio-political impacts and implications of a number of interactive computer processes as displayed on various proprietary consoles. Hey, Nitpick. Yes? Catch. Oh dear. I ran into some technical difficulties while preparing for the next Splinter Cell game, so this week we'll look at something else. As I've mentioned before, I like first-person shooter games. I also like World War II games. So if there was ever a game series that seems tailor-made for somebody like me, it's the Call of Duty games. This is probably one of the most successful series ever made because it's still going. I was a little bummed that the makers apparently decided they'd exhausted the World War II aspect and went on to modern warfare, but you know what? They have to go with what sells. If they didn't, there wouldn't be any more games. So I can't fault them for that. Fortunately for people like me, the older games are still around and still work. Some have even been ported to newer systems like the Wii. I do have a Wii, but I like to use it for multiplayer party type games and that sort of thing because I've found I don't really like the way the Wii controls operate in this kind of game. But they're available for systems like the Xbox 360, the PS2, and the GameCube, and I have all three. So I can play most any of these anytime I want. With that in mind, let's have a look at this incredibly popular series starting at the beginning with Call of Duty Finest Hour. There's no shortage of World War II FPS games, of course, but a couple of things set the Call of Duty ones apart from the very start. Finest Hours set the tone for subsequent games in several ways. For one thing, the action is pretty well non-stop. When you're in the middle of a mission, you don't want to do anything but concentrate on taking out the enemy because they just keep coming. The sound of gunfire all around you almost gets monotonous, there's so much of it. And the missions are really challenging. The game plays fair for the most part, but sometimes it's going to take several tries to figure out the secret to a mission, so even on the easiest version, expect to die. A lot. Another fairly unique feature of this game is the way you play as several different characters. Most FPS games, like Halo or the Brothers in Arms series, have you play through an entire game as one person. Not Finest Hour. The first set of missions takes place during the Siege of Stalingrad, and in that set you start out as a basic Russian foot soldier until you meet a woman sniper who stops to talk to you. Then suddenly you are that woman sniper. You take care of a few missions until you find yourself riding on a tank. Without warning, you're the tank commander. At each character switch, you get a short bio about the person you're going to be next, which is nice. It makes the people more real and gives you a better feeling of actually being there. This rapid switch of characters can be a little jarring to some people, especially insecure guys who have to play as a woman who can shoot better than they can. But I kind of like it. It shows the diversity of the people who dropped everything in their lives to defend their homeland against a vicious invader. The Soviet Union was nasty beyond comprehension, there's no question about that. But these individuals were just trying to protect their homes and families. I can respect that, and it's nice to play in such a way that I understand them a little better. By current standards, the graphics are a little cheesy, but for 2002 they were pretty good. The sound is excellent. The friendly AI? Well, it's there. That's as much as I can say. They can't hit squat. Most of the time they get into your line of fire and about half the time they get stuck on something and look like mechanical idiots. The only good thing is, some of the enemy AI do that too. Again, for its time period, it's not that bad. So as I said, you start out as a Russian soldier storming a beach. The most amazing thing about this level is, for the first part of it, you don't even have a gun. You get to a beach and in a landing craft, run up to an encampment and some guy gives you a handful of bullets. What are you supposed to do with them? Where's my gun? Then 
a sergeant tells you to follow him. He says, if you don't, he'll shoot you. Um, the Germans are throwing a kabillion bullets at me right now, so what's the difference if they shoot me or he shoots me? Either way, I'm just as dead. But, may as well follow him. And do what? The answer comes soon enough. convenient that the bullets they gave me just happened to fit the gun that the dead guy dropped? Yeah, I'll let that pass. You follow the sergeant through a maze of buildings, shooting Germans as you go, until you get to a window where your men are setting up a stationary machine gun to repel a German assault. Naturally, the gunner gets killed almost immediately, so guess who gets to take over? Get the machine gun! All day. I'm sorry you lost your sergeant, comrade. We won't let his sacrifice go to waste. I've got a new job for you. Hey, she's hot. Her bio was worth listening to. My name is Tanya Pavlovna. We had little idea the Nazi invasion had pushed as far as our village until the night we awoke to the sound of tank tracks grinding in the distance. Tank shells sent my neighbor scurrying for cover. And in the chaos I was separated from my parents. The next day I was rescued by soldiers with the Red Army. I was 25. During my first skirmish our squad was cut down, and I escaped into a collapsed building, where I took a sniper rifle off the body of a fallen comrade. My father's voice guided my aim as I cut down my first four Germans with that rifle. My skill was reported to HQ and I was assigned as a sniper and sent to Stalingrad. I've been hunting Germans ever since. They took my family and my home. And I intend to take their lives. So, she became a sniper by accident. And you just became her because the game says so. But sniping as Tanya is fun. You get some practice, then make your way to the real mission. Defending a tank factory until the tank crew can get there. Your main enemies here are Panzer Shreks. What the heck is a Panzer Shrek? Well, there are a few ways to find out. You could be fluent in German. No thanks, I have enough trouble with English. You could be a World War II buff who knows a lot about different weapons of that war. Or you could have played a lot of World War II games like I have and seen these things before, hopefully in at least one that told you what it is. To make life easier, I'll tell you. Panzer Schreck is German for bazooka. The Germans are trying to use them to blow the factory doors open so they can get in and destroy your tank. You have to take them down before they can do that, and stay alive in the process, since the Germans are also setting up machine guns that only have eyes for you. easy mode, you can expect to have a tough time with this. It's easily my least favorite level because it's just so hard and repetitive. 
To make matters worse, the checkpoint is clear back in the trenches, so you have to follow your spotter through them, dodging mortar blasts to get to the factory. I have to ask, why? Why isn't there a checkpoint in the factory where the real mission is? This is poor planning at its best. However, if you concentrate on the Panzer Shreks and the machine gunners, it's doable on all difficulties. Next, you have to go down to a side door and take out some Germans who are trying to keep the tank crew from reaching the factory. Once you've done that and the tank crew has made it to the factory, a cutscene shows the lovely Tanya riding on the tank out through a blown out wall. And without warning, you are now the tank commander. Your first task is to hold off a German advance while your mechanic fixes the tank because you didn't get a mile down the road before it started having engine trouble. Once that's done, you're driving the tank. The controls are really awkward. I don't know if the programmers just didn't know what to do with it, or if they're trying to make it feel authentic, or what the deal is, but steering in particular takes some major getting used to. The weapons are a little weird too. Obviously, the right trigger fires the cannon, but at least on the Xbox 360, the left trigger doesn't fire the machine gun. It zooms the cannon. To fire the machine gun, you have to hold down the left stick. Since that's also your steering control, it's practically impossible to drive and fire the machine gun at the same time. Like a real tank of the 1940s, turning both the tank and the turret is really slow, which can cost you some health. But eventually, you take out some German tanks, way too many German soldiers, and get to headquarters. Headquarters has another job for you. Fight your way across Red Square to the train station and deliver a new radio to the spotters who are telling HQ where to fire their rockets. The tank still drives like a drunk turtle, but eventually you get there. When you do, some of your comrades tell you the spotters are on the roof, but the building is crawling with German soldiers, so you'll have to fight your way up there. Wait a minute. The Russian spotters are on the roof and the whole building is full of enemy troops. And somehow they haven't encountered each other? Isn't that convenient? Oh well. This place is worse than a cheap county fair funhouse. It took me 10 minutes, and no, I am not exaggerating, to figure out where to go. And even then I made a couple of wrong turns and wound up somewhere else. The slow response of the compass, coupled with a lack of anything resembling a real map, doesn't help, but eventually, if you can stay alive long enough, you get the radio to the spotters, and then you get to sit back and watch the result. Yes! Take that! I like it! That armored column is a junkyard now! Okay, it's not the most creative line in the world, but I have to admit it's very Russian. Now, you and your tank buddies are moving out to an airfield at a nearby town. The idea is to destroy the planes that are dropping supplies to the German forces attacking Stalingrad. Without supplies, they should give up pretty quickly, or if they don't surrender, it should be a lot easier to finish them off. So away you go. You battle hordes of Germans with Panzerschrecks, plus a bunch of German tanks to get to the airfield, and then you start destroying planes. First the ones in the hangar area, then the ones that are trying to take off with supplies for the troops at Stalingrad. Hitting them while they're zooming down the runway is a nice challenge, especially when you have soldiers and tanks coming out of the woodwork to harass you while you're at it. I'm kind of glad they put in this thing with the planes, because to be honest, the whole thing with tanks and Panzer Shreks gets old real quick. <laughs>
expect to get all of them because it's not going to happen. But it really doesn't matter because the actual goal is just to get to the other end of the runway for the next assignment. What is that assignment? Head up the hill and take the last of the Germans who have barricaded themselves in the control tower. Halfway up the hill, you find that the road is blocked, so you have to finish the mission on foot. Well, sure, check out this blockage. From the vehicle, dismount. Sir, the fascists have barricaded themselves inside the control tower. Five or six huge Russian tanks couldn't possibly plow their way through that, now could they? But we don't want to make it too easy. So you can face mounted machine guns, a zillion enemy soldiers, and who knows what else. In my case, I got to do all this without any extra health at all. Oh joy. But that was my fault because there's one, count them, one health pack to be had before you start toward the tower. There are two machine guns, one on the tower and one on a half track off to the side. The second one is actually fairly easy to take out. Okay, that was cool. And if you move while the gun on the tower is reloading, it's possible to get past its range of fire without losing too much health. Now it's time to head up the stairs and take the tower itself. You fight your way up to the top, then come back down and grab some intel documents. Mission accomplished. So what's next? Next is about as far from Stalingrad as you can get and still be in the war. North Africa, with a British sabotage team trying to cut off Rommel's retreat from Tunisia. It's time to change characters again! By controlling North Africa, the Axis powers would have a better chance of holding the Mediterranean, now the epicenter of the war. Unfortunately for Italian dictator Benito Mussolini, his army is ill-prepared to withstand the British forces in the region. Hitler, fearful that more losses in Africa would jeopardize his efforts on the Russian front, sends General Ramo and his Africa Corps to clean up the mess. By 1942, the Allies decide that the best way to break the Axis powers back is to create another front. An Operation Torch is born of British and American troops, a well-supported, coordinated push through enemy lines, depleting and destroying fuel, food, and equipment would mean the eventual fall of the Third Reich in Africa, weakening Axis aggression throughout the world. All goes as planned, and by January 1943, British General Montgomery's 8th Army has Rommel and his troops on the run, scrambling to make their valiant last stand at the Marath Line. My wife finally wrote saying, Edward Carlyle, just asked to do something else. So I did. It turns out having a background in teaching chemistry can get you out of a desk job pretty quick if you have a mind to it. I knew nothing of Popsky's private army or its ties to the desert rats until I was in training. This sabotage platoon's philosophy is lightning fast strikes and massive explosions deep behind enemy lines. It's gratifying to know that every time we light up a fuel depot or munitions dump, we're stalling Rommel's tanks and helping those poor blighters on the front lines. It may not be fighting fair, but the Germans have hardly fought fair in Europe, so to hell with them. I know it sounds like I'm complaining, but really, I'm just having a little fun at the game's expense. The diversity here, going from Russia to Africa to Europe later and all the rest, is one of the things that makes the game so much fun. A Russian campaign, as long as this game is, would probably get boring. Ditto for any of the others. Putting it all together, having you see it from so many different angles, puts a spin on the war that I've never seen in a game before. And I suspect it accounts for how wildly popular the game still is. 
and some of the most brilliant design I've seen yet. So your team is setting up outside a German outpost. The job is to destroy as much of it as possible. Your leader says you should be in and out before the Jerry's know what hit them. Yeah, sure. And monkeys might fly out of my butt. It's never easy, as Zed says. As soon as you get started, the Germans are there to block your way. They have machine guns, tanks, you name it. You play the man with the C4, so you get to set charges on things like radio antennas and generators. You also have sticky bombs to use on tanks. Further in, you find some landmines. That's good because you're going to have three tanks to destroy with them. There's just one problem. get that? That's the third and final tank and it never moves. Landmines blow up when the tank rolls over them. If the tank doesn't move, the mine just sits there. So what the hell are you supposed to do? One time I got it with some of my sticky bombs. Another time I found some German grenades and lobbed a few at it until it blew up. But this is just bad programming, which is a surprise in this game. Anyway, once that's done, you battle your way to the entrance to a fuel, excuse me, petrol depot. Now it's time to destroy the fuel, excuse me, petrol reserves. The Germans have them conveniently stacked in five huge piles, and you just happen to have five more C4 charges. What a coincidence. The problem now is going to be health. There's a fair bit of it to be found in the previous section with the tanks, but you'll use most of it getting to this point. And then the Germans have at least three machine guns to cut you to ribbons. When that happens, and no, I don't mean if, I mean when, you'll find yourself back before the three tanks. What the hell? No checkpoints anywhere in that whole mess? Give me a break! That's one big shortcoming of this game. The checkpoints are few and far between, and their placement can be a little weird. The Russian sniper, for example. We already talked about that. It's the same here. A checkpoint after destroying those three tanks would be very nice for several reasons. One, it's just annoying having to do it all over again. Two, the health packs that are dropped aren't consistent. The first time I went through this, I found exactly one. The second time through, I found five. Third time I found two. In every case, I marked where I had found them the previous time, just to be sure. My first time through this section, I went back here because I thought it might be a way around a machine gun that was giving me trouble. I found a health pack right here. No Germans, nobody I shot or anything like that. It was just there. Next time through, I said, I know where there's a health pack. Nothing there except these guys that won't get out of my way. I have no idea why. It's like they're just stuck here and there in random places from one session to the next. No rhyme or reason to their placement. That frankly sucks. It's one of the few ways that this game really doesn't play fair. And it mars an otherwise excellent game experience. I did discover that when you pick up ammo it restores a bit of health. Don't ask, just go with it. But it's not enough. The playthrough you're watching is easy mode. And if this is easy, I'm not even going to think about the hardest one. So you get in here and set the first charge. Hey, wait a minute! Where the hell did those guys come from? How did they get behind me? We cleared the whole place before we moved on to here, yet enemies are still spawning behind me. Not fair! 
It'll take a few times to get through this. Here's one hint. If you use your rifle instead of your submachine gun, you can take out the guys on the German machine guns. It might take several shots and some unbelievably careful aiming, but it's doable. Try it. My only gripe is it takes at least two shots to kill the guy, even if the first one hits him in the head. Of course, I'm assuming it hit him in the head, because that's where I was aiming. Since there's no blood, no marks, no nothing, it's impossible to tell. But hey, it's an older game and overall it's pretty good for its age. Shut up! Every time you blow another stack of barrels, more Germans come out from behind you. If you've made it this far, you should have at least one friendly to cover your back, but he's as useful as the rest of the friendly AI in this game most of the time. If they get in close, they look like they're trying to dance with the Germans, and half the time they don't even shoot. So expect to take out most of the bad guys yourself, which means you need eyes in the back of your head as well as the front, because they're going to be shooting at you from both sides. Now, here's another hint. You don't have to get close enough to the barrel stacks to plant explosives on them. You don't need the explosives at all. Just throw a grenade at the barrel pile and it'll destroy it. When you finally manage to blow all five, you have to fight your way back to your jeep so you can leave. More fun with the AI, they all run on ahead of you so by the time you're making your way through a building to get to it, they're already in the jeep, telling you to get in. Where exactly were they when those last few Germans were shooting at you? Don't ask, it'll just make you mad. You mount one of the 50 caliber machine guns on the jeep and away you go. Next task, ride in the jeep and operate the gun. When I saw this next segment, I thought, oh no, don't tell me I have to drive again! Because if the jeep drove anything like those stupid Russian tanks, I didn't want anything to do with it. But no, you just ride in the back and shoot anything that moves or doesn't move. The tasks range from blowing up trucks blocking the road to shooting down planes that are flying over you. As always, at least in terms of the environment, they're going to go for realism, so the jeep is all over the place, and the least little bump in the road throws your aim off. It's a kick. This is one of the best segments in the game, but sadly, it's way too short. The goal is to get up to some fortress where some of your men are trapped by all the Germans in the universe. There's exactly two of you, you and your sergeant, and your job is to eliminate all the Germans in the universe and save the other guys. Piece of cake. So you get in the place and you see something really interesting. A non-stop stream of Germans pouring in from one entrance and a non-stop stream of your guys pouring in from another one. The reinforcements aren't doing you much good though because the Germans also have two machine guns keeping your men away from the tower where the captives are being kept. So first you have to take out the machine guns, then you're supposed to plant a charge on the entrance to stop the horde of Germans. I can only think of two words to describe this level. INSANE! Close enough. If you don't take out the machine gunners real quick and get over to plant that charge, expect to do this about 21,840 times. There are a couple of big problems here. First, there doesn't seem to be any way to take out the machine guns. You have an Enfield rifle, and if you're careful enough with it, you can hit them. But there's one up in the tower and one down in the courtyard, and if you don't move fast enough, take some hits and plant the charge to stop the German flood, it doesn't matter how many times you take out the tower gunner, another guy will grab the gun and keep shooting. The other problem is, the game is ridiculously stingy with health. You start with no extra, and there's one little health pack that you can find if you go in a direction that seems about as counterintuitive as it gets. Exactly what I think to go that way? The entrance and the machine guns are the other way. 
So of course, the only health pack available down here is off in another random direction. You'll find a couple more eventually. Where are they? Why, next to the German machine guns, of course. Where else would they be? Oh, I don't know. Anywhere else? Health is a big problem all through this game. You've already heard me whine about it a lot, so I'll switch gears for just a moment. You get to the top of the tower and rescue this sergeant. He tells you he got separated from his cartographer. His what? Oh, never mind. Just go with it. Why he's in the middle of the Tunisian desert with a map maker is beyond me, but I guess I don't need to know. Anyway, now you have to escort him to the cistern. The what? Oh, right, that's where they apparently took the cartographer. And he must survive. A German plane takes out your reinforcements before they can get there, so now you have to hold off another German advance coming through the other entrance until your reinforcements get there. Wait a minute. What? Oh, hell, just go with it. And the sergeant, as I said, must survive. So naturally, this genius runs ahead of everybody to meet the German advance head-on. Definitely somebody I want to keep in the gene pool. There is one sure way to have him survive this onslaught. Take a look. Well, it's keeping you out of the line of fire. After the reinforcements arrive and you've finished repelling the German attack, you have to take out a half-track and one more machine gun, and you're in the clear. So let's get him unstuck. So he ran up and crouched behind this wall while I scouted on ahead. Then suddenly I get this. Killed by what? There's nobody there! I eliminated all the enemy in the whole damn area. So what killed him? Who? Where? How? This is what you get when your game spawns bad guys out of nowhere in random order. And I don't care how you slice it, it is not playing fair. If you can ever keep this doofus alive long enough, you head to the underground park to find the cartographer. Maybe you need him to make you a map out of here or something. I didn't ask. You find him, watch a cutscene, and that's that. On to Europe. Just in case you're wondering, hello, it's not live. As I've mentioned before, I hit the wrong button. <laughs> Catch! <laughs> Cut the... <laughs> Fight your way across wet, wet square. And find Elmo fight before he gets that wastily wabbit. <laughs>